Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome back. My name is Mark Goodman. I'll be your MC for the rest of the afternoon. We have a terrific set of presentations coming up. And we're going to begin it oh, with an incredible keynote by Scott Harrison, the founder of Charity Water. Uh, he's going to take you on a crazy and amazing journey from the world of New York City nightlife to this charity, being on the Forbes Impact 30, having Charity Water receive a Google Global Impact Award. And it's going to tell you all about how their mission to bring clean water to every single human being in the world works and the technologies is embraced and reveal some secret and cool new stuff about his plans for the future. You're in for a treat because a very feature-rich performance. We got tons of photos. He used to be a photojournalist, so it's going to be terrific. Please give a warm welcome to Scott Harrison. Hey, guys. It's great to be back at the Metropolitan Pavilion. The last time uh, I was here, we had one of our galas here, and there were like 2,000 people in the room, and it was uh, an amazing, amazing experience. I haven't been back uh, in a while. So I'm going uh, to talk a little bit, about, uh, little bit about my story and how I got into the nonprofit space from uh, a decade in nightlife, a decade of partying, and getting people drunk for a living. I'm going to talk a little bit about water, but rather than just hit you guys with tons of statistics, I'm going to show a lot of images and videos that I've taken from around the world and introduce you to some of the people that I've met over the last six years. And then I'll talk about uh, Charity Water and some of the things we've done uh, over the last uh, yeah, six years to try to bring clean drinking water to as many people as possible. So my story uh, starts when I was uh, about a four-year-old kid. Uh, my parents used a cereal bowl to cut my hair. Born uh, in Philadelphia, middle-class family. Mom and dad were healthy. Uh, loved each other, loved me. And then there was this terrible tragedy in our house when we moved into uh, this new home and unbeknownst to us, the gas furnace was leaking carbon monoxide uh, throughout the house. So uh, I was spending as little time in the house as you can imagine at four, like at school playing with my friends. My dad is working brutal hours at a new job and my mom is fixing up the house, breathing in these carbon monoxide fumes. So one day she walks across the bedroom and she collapses unconscious. And we take her into the hospital and realize that uh, she has been poisoned. And thankfully these fumes hadn't killed her, but it had irreparably destroyed her immune system. So I watched my mom go from you know, super healthy, vibrant journalist, great mom, to debilitated, uh, an invalid. Uh, she would have to wear these charcoal masks. She would uh, be connected to oxygen and pretty much anything chemical made her sick. So family planning stopped, uh, and I, I went into a role for the next uh, 10 or so years of taking care of mom, doing all the cooking, doing all the cleaning. Uh, grew up uh, really active in, in my church, and my parents decided not to sue the gas company because of their, you know, their very deep Christian faith. They didn't want to get into a, a long lawsuit and a, a bitter battle. And at 18, after you know, taking care of mom for so many years, I, like, like this bad cliche, I rebel. I moved to New York City. Uh, I grow my hair down to my shoulders and I join a band. And I am going to do every single thing I was not allowed to do growing up here in the city with relish. So the band immediately breaks up because we didn't like each other. So that took about a month. But I learned that there was this job in New York City and you could get paid to drink alcohol for free. All you had to do was fill up nightclubs full of beautiful people. And if you got the right people in the nightclubs, you could charge them $15 a cocktail or $350 for a bottle of booze. And some people would buy five just to get in the club. So literally the next 10 years of my life from 18 to 28 just kind of flashed by. I mean, there are entire years I don't remember anything about. Uh, this is me at 28. So I, I always show this photo because it shows just what an idiot I was. I am holding out the Rolex watch so that the photographer notices that I own an expensive watch. So life looked glamorous on the outside. This was actually a few blocks from here and uh, we were getting paid $2,000 a month, uh, my partner and I, to, to drink Bacardi in public. We were getting another $2,000 a month to drink Bud in public. And uh, 
what looked glamorous was not a little later. So if you'd run into me around five or six in the morning, it would have looked like this, a lot darker. So by this point, you know, I have picked up just about every single vice that you can imagine comes with 10 years of nightlife. Uh, vices you've heard of, maybe some you even haven't. And thankfully, uh, on a, a New Year's Eve trip to Punta del Este in Uruguay, on this kind of perfect vacation, um, I realized I had all the things that should have made me happy. I had the BMW, I had the grand piano, I had the beautiful girlfriend, I had the, the Rolex watch, I had the Labrador Retriever that I thought uh, I always wanted. And I was, I was uh, I'm the worst person I know. I mean, I am the most selfish, sycophantic, arrogant, and I, my legacy is gonna be that I got people wasted <laughs> for a living. And I got paid to do that. So I, I did some soul searching and I, I wound up kind of coming back to a very long lost uh, faith as a kid and you know, started asking the question, what would it look like to, to do a 180? What would the exact opposite of my life look like? What would it look like to try to serve and live out that faith with integrity? So it took me about six months, but I, uh, I got the idea that the opposite of my life would look like applying to a humanitarian organization and volunteering in Africa. So I started applying to you know, the big organizations you would have heard of, and one by one I'm denied to volunteer. And they're all like saying, you know, what, dude, what is a nightclub promoter? And how would you be useful for us? We are serious people. Like we're helping the, you know, the mission to Sudan. So uh, denial, denial, denial. Finally, one organization said, if you pay us $500 a month, you can volunteer. I said, no problem. I gave them my credit card details. And uh, the fall of 2004 at 28, I, I sail on a giant hospital ship into a country I'd never heard of called Liberia. So at the time, um, I, I actually thought Africa was a country, not made up of more than 60 countries. Uh, thing about what I was going to see. So I, I, I joined this organization as their photographer, and I say, look, I'm a decent photographer, I'm a decent writer, maybe I can connect the work of your humanitarian work with the 15,000 people I know in nightlife that I've sold alcohol to over the last 10 years. So they say, uh, okay, pay us $500 a month, I join the ship, uh, I, I move into like 200 square feet down by the water line with a couple roommates and cockroaches because it was a really old ship. And it was a simple mission. Uh, in fact, they were just on 60 Minutes uh, a few weeks ago. Bring doctors, the best doctors in the world, to countries that have no access to medical care. And instead of going on vacation to Atlantis, the doctors go to Monrovia, Liberia, and they operate for free every day. So I, I got off the ship, I started documenting what life was like in this post-war environment. You know, Liberia had come out of 14 years of brutal civil war and Charles Taylor had decimated this country uh, with, with his child soldiers. When we rolled in, there was no public electricity, no running water, no sewage, no mail anywhere in the country. And there was one doctor for every 50,000 people. So if you got sick in Liberia, you were just out of luck. People were living in houses without roofs, without uh, without windows. And I learned pretty quickly that I was in over my head. Now, before our doctors had, had sailed in, we flyered the country and we posted these pictures, basically, of the, the people that we were going to be able to help. And we said, if you've got a giant tumor, if you have a flesh-eating disease, if you, you know, have a, a, a cleft lip or a cleft face, if you've been burned during the war, turn up and our doctors may try to help you. And I'll never forget my third day on the mission, I was so, so excited because I was with the doctors and we were gonna be helping people. And we were screening patients at a 5,000 person stadium. And I knew we had about 1,500 surgery slots. And I'll never forget when I rolled up at 5.30 in the morning, there were 7,000 people standing outside the stadium. And that was a really tough realization that over 5,000 people were not gonna get help. And as we talked to them, we learned some of them had walked over a month just to see a doctor, just in the hopes of getting their condition treated. Some of the first things I saw were shocking. Uh, the first child that I had to photograph was a boy named Alfred, and he had a four pound tumor that was suffocating him to death. And he was literally just choking to death on his own face. And I, I remember just breaking down. I kind of ran in the corner and started crying. And, I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. I'd never seen anything like this before. And the medical officer came over and said, Scott, you signed up for a year of this. You will see much worse than this boy. Get back there, do your job. And by the way, we're going to be able to help him. And his story is going to end really well. And I managed to uh, photograph you know, thousands 
uh, take thousands of photos this next couple days, get through the screening. And then the photographer or, or the uh, medical officer said, why don't you join Alfred's surgery and why don't you scrub up and see it and photograph it? So I was able to do that a couple days later. And I watched these, doomers, these doctors remove his tumor and set it down on a tray. And then they said, why don't you take him home and see what it's like when a child who's been written off for dead is welcomed back into his village. And I got to do that about a week later. And I got to watch Alfred heal. It was incredibly powerful. And that's what life was like on this mission. Every single day, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go down to the ward to photograph Martheline. And I'd sit with her and I'd learn her story. And this thing had been growing for 10 years. She has a towel in her hand because people would throw rocks at her when she left her house. They thought she was cursed. What she simply needed was a doctor, a 40-minute operation just to cut out the benign tumor. So for that year, I took about 50,000 photographs and, and I could, gosh, I could do a 10-hour presentation introducing you to all of these amazing, amazing people, to some of the amazing doctors. But I signed up for a second year. I actually came back um, just for a, a brief period of time and, and did an exhibition of these photos here at the Metropolitan Pavilion and, and shared the images with my friends in nightlife. And they wound up getting involved. They wound up giving. Some of them wound up volunteering. Yeah. I went back to Liberia for the second time and it's there that I really started learning that uh, dirty water was making some of these people sick. And I started hearing the statistics about all of the global disease caused by bad water. And thankfully for me, even though it was a huge medical operation, there was one guy off to the side, and he was given a little bit of the extra money to work in the villages. And I would document his work, and he would show me what people were drinking. I remember the first time I saw someone drinking from a swamp. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I would never drink water that was green, that had algae and bugs in it. I wouldn't step in water like that. I wouldn't let my dog drink it. And I would see people come out of the woods, young children, fill up their buckets, take it back, and drink the water. So what uh, my friend Leif was doing is he was working with the locals how to tap into the clean groundwater that was 30 feet beneath the village. And I couldn't believe the irony in that. Communities living on top of clean water that didn't have the resources, that didn't have the knowledge how to access it for $5,000. And then he'd take me back when the, the well was finished and I could drink clean water right next to the swamp, a stone's throw away from the swamp. And in everything I'd seen, I'd seen all these amazing surgeries, but this guy seemed to be making the biggest impact of them all. He was touching thousands of people for a fraction of the cost of the surgeries. And he was really answering what I thought was maybe the question behind the question of so much of this sickness, the root cause. So I came back here uh, to New York City. I was now 30. Um, I'd left kind of all my vices uh, at the bottom of the gangway of the ship. And, you know, my friends were half expecting me to get back in nightlife, but all I wanted to do was, you know, use the rest of my life to serve and, and make a big, as big of an impact as possible. And there's an incredible responsibility that comes with seeing. When, when you see stuff like this, when people ask you for help, when they ask you to go and tell their story, it weighed really heavily on me. I'd seen just about every problem you could imagine and uh, you know, kids without access to education, people dying of AIDS and malaria, I'd spent time in leprosy colonies, but I just kept coming back to the, the swamp and the belief that no one in the world should have to drink water like that. No man, no woman, no child. And that's where the, uh, the idea for Charity Water was born uh, down in Soho about six and a half years ago. So I'll talk uh, a little bit about the water crisis, and again, I'm not just going to hit you with statistics. I can tell you 800 million people don't have clean water, so it's about an eighth of the world. I can tell you 5,000 kids will die today of bad water. I can tell you 40 billion hours are wasted in Africa just walking for water every year. But over the last few years, I've been to 15 countries. I've, I've been in hundreds and hundreds of villages, and I've really been able to put a face and, and names to some of those statistics. So if you came with me, you, know, you would meet kids like John Bosco, 15 years old, and you'd watch him walk into the swamp and fill up his you know, five-gallon jerry can of dirty water and take it home and give this water to his family. I started learning about all the diseases, and you know, some of you guys have obviously heard of these diseases. Cholera, everybody's heard of. Some associated with water you may not have, like schistosomiasis. It's just a really fancy word for parasites or worms crawling around 300 million people's body right now because they drank bad water. 
I wondered would water like this look like under a microscope. So I, I took it back once and I gave it to the, the lab at Rockefeller University on the Upper East Side and said, would you guys put this under a microscope? And they made me this video. And they said, the water's alive. <laughs> we don't know what all the amoebas and parasites are, but nobody should be drinking water like that. I'm pretty sure none of you here or, or watching online have ever associated leeches with your drinking water, but this is just an open spring. And time and time again, we would hear and see that leeches were one of the biggest problems for people in these rural communities. And they would show us the leeches and they'd say, the big ones we can always pretty much, you know, we can filter them out using cloth, using our scarves. But the little ones will sometimes get through our filtration and then they grow up inside us and the leech's favorite spot is the back of the neck, the back of the throat. Two ways we would hear that, that communities get the leech out. They either drink a little bit of diesel fuel, enough to kill the leech and not to, to kill their child or themselves, or they use a stick and they pry the leech from the back of the throat, but then sometimes they don't always kill the leech and then it just crawls up and they have the same problem again. It was hard to believe the it's the everyday reality for so many of these people. Started learning about schools without water. Now, if there was a second issue I was passionate about, it would have been education. And I kept encountering school after school without clean water and without toilets. And I thought to myself, how could people, how could kids get a good education if there wasn't even water at their school, if there are no toilets? Started learning of the, the negative impact of not having a toilet. Has on teenage girls who wind up staying home four or five days a month if there's no place to access a toilet, if there's no place to access clean water. And it's unfortunately, in, in the rural areas, in most developing nations, it's the job of the women and the children to carry the water. And you see girls 10, 12 years old, you know, hunched backs as they carry 40 pounds of water, sometimes three, four, five hours a day. Probably the toughest story I ever heard was one I heard last year. And I was up in northern Ethiopia, it was my 16th time or 15th time in the country. And I was in the northwest and I was at a six dollar a night hotel. And there was a guy uh, that owned the hotel and he came up to me and said, you're the charity water people, yeah we know what you've been doing in the region, uh, it's great. Let me tell you a, a story from my village about what water means to me. And he started to tell me about this woman that lived 10 years ago. So she lived way before charity water started and I actually don't have her picture. But this is a picture of a woman about her age from the region. And she did not have the jerry can. She didn't have the kind of yellow, you know, very light jug. She had a clay pot. And the clay pot weighs 10 pounds empty and then you put another 30 or 40 pounds of water on it. So she was walking, he said, eight hours a day. I remember we just couldn't believe it. Three hours out, five hours back. And he said one day um, she walked into his village and they saw her slip and fall. And the water that she had spent eight hours collecting, uh, the clay pot broke and all the water spilled out. And he said rather than go back to the village or back to the, the water source, he said she hung herself from the rope from her clay pot in a tree in the middle of the village. And he left us with that. And then he said, keep up the good work. Go faster. It was, you know, a sober reminder for all of us of the urgency that you know, these were not statistics. The 800 million people was not just a fancy number, that there were people right now walking and they had no hope. The horrible irony is if she lived today, we've done 2,000 water projects in her region. She will get, her village will get clean water later this year. Maybe she would have actually gone back had she known that there were organizations, both Ethiopian and, and here, people that actually did care about her, that did want to do something about it. What was so frustrating for me as I saw this incredible need was that it was a completely solvable problem, right? There were solutions. In fact, we knew how to solve the water crisis in its entirety. No one solution works. There was no silver bullet, but if you were solution agnostic, you could bring every single person clean water. So sometimes it was a hand dug well, and sometimes it was a rainwater harvesting system, or filters at the community level, at the household level. Sometimes you could cap mountain springs. Sometimes you could drill wells. A couple weeks ago, I was in Cambodia. It cost $65 there to give a family clean water. And you take nasty water like this, you pour it through a $65 household filter made with local materials, sand, gravel, rock. 
Up to 21 days, a one inch layer of good bacteria forms that kills 21%, to, or after 21 days, it kills 99% of all the bad bacteria. And you get this kind of water out that you could drink or I could drink. And in fact, I did. But $11 a person. About $5,000, you can hand dig a well, and that's what my friend was doing in Liberia. You see here, the water starts coming in, and now is the tricky part. People ask me all the time, how come they don't just do it themselves? Well, this is the part where you actually need technology to make a sustainable well. So the water's coming in at the feet, and you need generators and dewatering pumps so you can go another 20 feet beneath the top of the water table so that the well is working all 12 months of the year. The water table is rising and falling. You make concrete culverts, and this forms the lining of the well so it doesn't collapse over time. About $10,000, you can drill a well, and you just need a million dollar uh, piece of drilling equipment, compressors, trucks, eight train drillers that are locals. And you get massive amounts of water. And there was three liters per second coming out of this simple well. It was enough for a thousand kids at the school, and it was enough for over a thousand people in the village called Abanea. And we've seen that you know, water, when it could be brought into communities, it really had the ability to change everything. It was transformative. And so water obviously brings health, right? A kid drinking water like this is probably not going to die of diarrhea, not going to have worms if he has clean water. We would hear stories time and time again of students that now had all of these hours back in their day and they could spend more time at their school. If their school had clean water, and sanitation and toilets, then attendance rates would go up. Women would get extra time back, and they would tell us that we're able to use this extra time to start small businesses, and sometimes earning an extra dollar or two a day, selling peanuts, selling rice, selling flour at the market. Some women just told us we're better moms. We spend more time with our kids. We don't have to walk in the hot sun every day to get water that will make our family sick. What I loved about the, the issue was that it was, it was measurable, it was tangible, it was provable. And it was, someone that no, it was something nobody would argue about, right? There's no one sitting in this room, there's no one watching online that thinks that that child should be drinking the water on the left. If you do, then you probably have a problem. I mean, we don't even begrudge our enemies clean water. You would give them a cup of water and then you go to war. It's kind of an, an inarguable right for everyone. And if we knew how to do something about it, then why were we allowing this to happen? Water makes people wealthier. A lot of data started coming out about water making people um, wealthier. So healthier and also wealthier. The UN came out with a powerful statistic saying every dollar you invest in water and sanitation, water and toilets, returns four to 12 dollars in the local economy. So imagine investing a million dollars and getting four million or 12 million dollars back. It was the time saving with the improved health the ability to work, improved education. So lots of data around how important water is to communities, a lot of work to be done in sustainability. This is a hard part, but you would train local water committees. So the ownership needed to belong to the community. And here you can see a, a local water committee in Uganda. You've got caretakers and treasurers and vice chairman and uh, the secretary, the guy here with the book, would not let us take his picture until he got his book. And, and that's where he records the little bit of money that he collects from every single person that uses the water point. So this is the group that is in charge of maintaining the well, and they collect money. So it's their job to make sure that it's working over time. Wonderful story that, uh, that we ran into that made us think even differently about water. A woman named Helen Appio, and she lived in northern Uganda. And uh, our head of water programs at the time was was, it was at the end of a long day, it was just trying to go into Helen's village and see the, the water point being used. So there's a lot of fanfare normally when, when they know that, that the donor's coming or the organization that, that helped is coming and you know, the, it's a throw, a knockdown kind of party, popcorn, coffee, um, dancing. So she wanted just to escape that. Well, it was unsuccessful. Helen found out she was coming, blocked the road and led a group of women. So that took a while to, uh, to settle down, and 
Becky wound up sitting with Helen, and Helen started telling Becky her story. And she said, you know, I actually used to get clean water before, but it was really far away. I would walk hours to a well, and uh, because there were so many people trying to use it, I would have to wait. So she said, I could only take two jerry cans a day. She said, I had a husband and two kids, and I would have to make choices every single day. What do I do with the water? Garth, do I? And she said, I always put myself last and my family first. And she said, now that there is a well in the middle of my village, now I can take six jerry cans a day. She said, now I'm beautiful. It took Becky kind of a second to unpack that and said, well, Helen, of course you're beautiful. What do you mean? She said, no, no, now I feel beautiful because there's enough water for me to wash my clothes and my face. And we never thought of water as, as uh, had the power to restore dignity. You know, those six jerry cans for four people, that's about a, a 50th of what we use here every single day and, and often take for granted. So that's just a little bit about the issue. Um, I'll talk about Charity Water and how we have tried to, to solve it and, and innovate over the last few years. So started out um, really broke. Uh, I came back from the Mercy Ship. I, I'd given all my money to Mercy Ships. Nightclub promoters are awful at saving money. So it wasn't a great time to, uh, to start a charity, but I was crashing on a friend's couch, and he said, you can use this couch as your office. And I just decided to go for it and, and see you know, how big of an impact I could make and if I could get people excited about this. So, if you'd run into me then, you would have heard what I'm going to tell you now. I wanted to end the water crisis in my lifetime, help create a world that you know, nobody had to drink dirty water, that my kids and my grandkids could live in and be proud of. And I also wanted to reinvent giving, reinvent charity. A little bit on this. As I talked to my friends in New York, they kept saying, I'm not giving because I don't trust charities. I heard the black hole of charity so many times. You know, my money goes into this big black hole and I don't know how much reaches the people. I never hear from them again except to ask me for more money. I don't know who it helps. I don't feel any connection to that. I don't feel a, a transparency. And I thought, man, we could solve this and probably get a lot of people to come back and take another look at giving with a new model. So I had three ideas at the beginning. I thought, well, what if there was a way to solve the money flow problem by just always using 100% of the public's money? To, to fund water projects. Never touch it for your staff or overhead or, or even our flights to manage these projects. And people said, you know, well, dude, how are you going to pay for like, a staff? And how are you going to run your organization? I had no good ideas at the time, but I did open up two bank accounts with $100 down at the, uh, the Broadway and Bond branch of Commerce and thought maybe we can get board members to, to actually pay for staff. Maybe we get sponsors, corporations, foundations, private donors. I didn't know to make this 100% model possible. We said, well, if we're going to do 100%, it should be a real 100%. We should even pay back credit card fees. So if someone donated $1,000 and you know, we only got 90, 970, we should separately raise that 3% and send all 1,000 to the field. And we've actually never broken that promise from day one, and we figured out how to make this model, this pure model, work. Secondly was, well, we knew all the money was going to be going to the field, so just prove it and use technology to do that. So I'd, I'd walked into an electronic store and saw GPS devices cost $100. So for $100 and two AA batteries, we could know where every project was, everywhere in the world, within 10 feet. And we said, we'll always make that information transparent on Google Maps and Google Earth. And we've done that from day one. And then the third thing, I guess, was a little softer, but I really wanted to build a brand. And there wasn't a single nonprofit brand that I looked up to in the way that I looked up to the, the Apples, the Nikes of the world. And I thought, if we're going to solve a problem this big, we are going to need an epic brand, a creative brand, an imaginative brand, an aspirational brand. Nick Kristoff had written in the New York Times that people peddle toothpaste with more sophistication than all the world's life-saving causes. I thought, man, that's so broken. And you didn't really need to spend a lot of money to build a brand. You just needed good taste and talented people, talented designers. So day one was six and a half years ago. The only thing I knew how to do to get this thing started was to go back to the nightclubs and throw a party. 700 people came. I gave them open bar. I charged them $20 at the door. But this time, instead of keeping the money, we took it all to a refugee camp in northern Uganda where 31,000 people lived. We fixed three wells. We built three wells. And then we sent the photos and the GPS back to those 700 people. And I, they couldn't believe it. They never expected to hear from a charity for $20 a 
and an open bar, and they got to see what actually happened. That 700 people here actually changed lives across the world living in a refugee camp. We tried to be creative and we said we're going to have a marketing budget of zero, but if we came up with clever ad campaigns, maybe we get donated media. And we said we don't always need to take ourselves so seriously. We can have a little bit of fun. Most of the time we did take ourselves seriously and tried to, you know, shock people a little. You know, bring these mind-numbing statistics to life. I'm sure there are a lot of parents here. None of you could imagine 4,500 kids doing anything, let alone dying. But maybe giving your child death in a baby bottle would, would resonate more with people. We wound up getting buses donated, taxis, full-page ads in magazines, million-dollar time slots on television. Started shooting rich people here in New York City in the same situations as the people we were serving around the world. Imagine if it was your mom. Imagine if those were your kids going to private school carrying 40 pounds of water on their back. Imagine if you know, your banker friends went up to Central Park Pond in their fancy suits at lunch break. We would never allow this. Why was it okay for an eighth of the world, when we knew how to do something about it. We took over galleries, uh, we did exhibitions here, the Chelsea Market, just trying to show people these images, get them to care. Partnered with brands like Saks Fifth Avenue, and this was a fun one, we said, you guys sell $5,000 handbags, we sell $5,000 wells, we should totally partner. <laughs> For some reason they didn't kick us out of their offices and they said, we love what you're doing, and they wound up shooting their catalogs in water. They wound up giving us the windows on Fifth Avenue to put up jerry cans, to, to put up images. And then they started telling their employees, their vendors, selling wells to Gucci and Chanel and Prada and Marc Jacobs and Tom Ford. They wound up raising $700,000 as a company. McAllen came to us and they said, we make whiskey, there's a lot of water in whiskey, and there's a lot of water in Scotland. I'm serious. So they got the idea to take their oldest whiskey, a 64-year-old McAllen, on a world tour. And they said, we're going to charge people $5,000 just to taste it. We are like, who would pay $5,000 for 10 centiliters of whiskey? $605,000 later, they were the ones laughing at us from a single bottle. Broke the Guinness World Record and fetched three times more than any bottle in the history of spirits. We loved social media, and this is Internet Week, and we were early adopters on all the platforms. We were the first charity to reach a million followers on Twitter. We were actually one of the first three brands to ever use Instagram, not only the first charity. We, our, our story was simple. You know, people needed water. Here are the solutions, and we'll prove them to you. We'll prove the results. You can see where 100% of your money goes. And then we stumbled on this big idea, and it really started to grow. And some of you have, have done this, some of you have heard about this, or maybe given to other people's campaigns, but we said, our birthdays, right? It's, it's all about us. We get stuff we don't need. What if we could turn our birthdays into giving moments? What if we could use our birthdays to help people get clean water and ask for our age in dollars? And maybe that would be sticky enough. I gave up my 32nd birthday and wound up raising a lot more money and a, a seven-year-old kid gave up his seventh birthday in Texas, starts knocking on doors, asking for $7, and he raises $22,000. We realize this is a big idea. Everybody's got a birthday. Everybody can care about clean water. Nobody needs another belt or iTunes gift card. Justin Bieber gave up his birthday, he tweeted three times, raised $47,000, started spreading through Hollywood. People like Kristen Bell, uh, people like Tony Hawk giving up birthdays started spreading through technology. People like Daniel Eck and, and Jack Dorsey giving up multiple birthdays. Will and Jada Smith giving up their birthdays, challenging their fans to give up birthdays. And then they came with me last year to actually see what they had done in these rural communities. Most of the money was not raised by famous people. It was just kids like Maggie, 16 years old, giving up her birthday, giving up her party, raising enough for an entire water project. Or people like Nona giving up her 89th birthday. God bless Nona, she didn't even raise $89. She wrote this beautiful mission statement, you know, realizing that she was double the life expectancy in so many of these countries where we work. Our birthdays so people could have more birthdays. Some people said, I can't wait, I need to do something now. And they started climbing mountains for charity water, trying to raise a dollar a foot up to the top of the mountain. Some people started skydiving, I mean, stuff we'd never thought of giving up weddings, giving up honeymoons, giving up anniversaries, making sails, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, 
walking across America. Four or five groups have done this now. It takes four months. I mean, incredible dedication, walking in solidarity for the women walking every day. Riley ate rice and beans for a month, raised $15,000. Most of the stories were incredibly happy. They were creative. Our fundraisers inspired us with their creativity. Right now, there's a guy in Afghanistan writing haikus for Charity Water. I mean, stuff we would have never thought of. There was one tragic story, a girl named Rachel. And she gave up her birthday and tried to raise $300, wound up falling a little short, raising $220 before she was killed in a horrible car crash. She lived in Seattle. There was a 20-car pileup, but she was the only death. And uh, I was in Central African Republic. I landed in New York. I found out about this tragedy, and her family said, can we open up her page and honor her last wish? And we did, and people started donating $9. It started out in her church community. It spread to the Seattle community. It spread around the entire United States. And then people in Africa started donating $9 and leaving beautiful notes saying, we have heard about this girl in Seattle that gave up her birthday gifts so that we could have clean water. Rachel wound up raising $1.3 million from a $300 goal. Inspiring. Thank you, guys. I, I don't have time for it now, but we took her mother and her grandparents on the one-year anniversary of her death to meet the people that their daughter had helped, their granddaughter had helped in Ethiopia, and it was the most incredible experience. Over 37,000 people will get clean water because of Rachel. You guys can see that um, on our website if you want. So what we realized was, you know, it really started out as our story. It was a scrappy, disruptive startup story, and we were working 80 hours a week, and we were trying to do things differently. But then it changed, and, and people started turning this into their story. And it became the story of Max, and Nona, and Riley, and Maggie. The story of Rachel, the story of 30,000 people around the world inspired by her. And we realized if we could get out of the way, if we could take a back seat, if we could focus on giving our story away, maybe this thing really could scale. Now, maybe we could solve this problem just through people, through ordinary people that cared. So we started really focusing on stewardship, on how to connect people to their money. And we built something called Dollars to Projects. And this is what it looked like when Maggie's money was sent to the field. She got an accounting for all $5,709, every single penny. She could see that she fully funded the village at My Willow. 545 people live there. She could see the photos of her name actually in that village, which just made it real for her. On a sign or on a plaque. She could see where it was in the world and kind of cruise around the village on Google Maps. And then every donor, even if they gave a dollar or $16, got an accounting for where 100% of their money went. Last year, uh, we needed more drilling rigs, and we thought, well, instead of going to a big company and asking for a million dollars, what if we could get 10,000 people to give about $100? So we crowdsourced the world's first drilling rig. We called it Yellow Thunder. But then we said, how do we connect these 10,000 amazing people to this rig, right? It's going to drill for the next 15 years, drill 80 wells a year. So we bought a GPS device, and we mounted it to the thing, and we wound up building a tracking system so the 10,000 people would know where their rig was in real time for the next 15 years. And then we gave it a Twitter account, and it tweets every time it drills. So you can actually see the exact location. So we're focused on transparency, focused on connecting people and showing them their impact. What I'm probably most excited about is, uh, is a new partnership with Google. And, you know, we're, we're doing our best to train local water committees around the world, but we thought, what if we could actually know that water is flowing over time in all these villages? We would hate for Helen's village to not be working right now, for her well to be broken. We'd hate for any of Rachel's wells to stop working in four or six years. So we said, what if we could develop a sensor that we can put in all of these different water solutions that could give us real-time data, that could show us, hey, water is flowing, and even how much? And maybe we could pass that information along to a 16-year-old girl on a smartphone app. And she could wake up in the morning and see how many gallons or how many people she had helped in a rural village in India. It's not something you can ask kids to give up their birthday for, so Google said, we're in. They wound up awarding us a $5 million grant, the largest gift they'd ever given a nonprofit. And at the moment, we're working with seven labs 
to develop these sensors. At the same time, we're training local mechanics who can go and act on that data. Men and women throughout the world, kind of a, a geek squad. Should the community be unable to fix it? Should the government be able to, unable to fix it? Communities that can, or local mechanics that can go out and bring the projects back online. So all this has worked. This new approach uh, has worked. This is a, a pilot from a couple weeks ago of a, a solar sensor. It's added up to $99 million. So we're actually about to cross through the 100 million milestone, uh, we think, later this week. It's not about the money for us. It's really about the people that we've been able to get involved, but most importantly, the people getting clean water around the world. So over 3.2 million people will get clean water in 20 countries, 8,000 villages. It's been a growth story. We averaged 63% year-over-year growth in the first six years in one of the worst times to raise money in the history of this country. Giving was actually net negative over those six years. So we think this new approach, transparency, trying to connect people, will continue to work. Last year, we gave almost 2,000 people clean water every day, one person every 42 seconds. This year, we're hoping to break through a million. And as we look ahead, we're thinking even bigger. We put a stake in the ground at 100 million people over the next 10 years. We think maybe we make our local paper, if we can make that happen. It's going to require an extraordinary amount of money, billions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, millions of people to get involved around the world. But we actually think this problem can be solved through everyday people. People like you, people like the people watching right now, giving up birthdays, creatively using your gifts or your talents to help other people get clean water. So if you guys are asking how you can help, a couple simple ways. Obviously, you could just support water projects and know that 100% goes and you'll be able to see where the money goes. But more importantly, you can give up your next birthday. You can pledge it. Even if it's 11 months away, we remind you, we give you the simple ways to do that. And the average birthday raises $1,000 and gives about 50 people clean water. And there's probably people here that wouldn't be able to even donate that much, but would be able to say, you know what, I, I don't need gifts. I'm going to turn my birthday into uh, an act of generosity. I'm going to help other people get clean water. And uh, you and your entire community would be able to see exactly where that goes. If you'd like more information about that or any of the other uh, things that I've talked about, you can go to charitywater.org or charitywater.org slash birthdays. Thank you guys uh, so much for listening. Scott, thank you so much.